I want to go to John chapter 4 and a very well-known verse, verse 24, says, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. But I want us to see the context of this verse as we seek to, to understand the meaning because a lot of people quote this verse and um, they have, them have different meanings. But I, I want to look at it in context. Most times we get the full meanings of passages when we see the context they are used in. And clearly you see that these are Jesus' words as written in red here. But I want to go up to where it started in verse 6. Um, maybe verse 5. Verse 5 says, Then cometh he, Jesus, to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, or Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Verse 7 says, There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. So Jesus comes and he sits on the side of this well here. This well has history. It is, it is a well that goes way back to when Jacob gave a parcel of land to his son, Joseph. So it has history to the Jews. But here is where the Samaritans are living. And he's passing through the city of Samaria. And I'm going to give you a little background regarding the Samaritans in a little while. But Jesus says to the Samaritan woman who comes to draw water, beg you some water. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy food. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him. Now we're going to see something coming out here. Then said the woman of Samaria to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask him drink from me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Now this is something that we need to understand. And I'm going to fill you in a little bit to the background to what this woman says. Because... We have heard about the Good Samaritan. We have heard about different things regarding the Samaritans. But I need us to understand that there was an ongoing feud, an ongoing misunderstanding between the Jews and the Samaritans. So who were the Samaritans? When Nebuchadnezzar came to, to, to Jerusalem and he was conquering this area, and what Nebuchadnezzar did, he, can, he played a kind of a fruit basket turnover with the people. He was a very astute king. So what he would do is sometimes he would move large populations. Now, he didn't go and kill off the people, but he would take a whole segment of a population and move it to a different region and take some from that region and put it into that. So when he took most of Judah to Babylon, he didn't take all of them, but he took most of the Jews to Babylon and he took other people and settled them in, in, in Judah, in Jerusalem area. Not all the Jews were taken out. He didn't take everybody out. He was kind of, in, in, in being, in conquering the region, Nebuchadnezzar was being smart. So he would take some people from one place, put them in with others, and mix them up so that you, you know, by doing that, you wouldn't get a cohesion. So the rebellion, the likelihood of rebellion would be much less because you have people who are not going to be collaborating so well with each other. So he was being very smart. So not all the Jews were carried off to Babylon. The elderly and the sick were left, and many of the temple scribes were left there to care for these people. So the country became almost vacant, but you still have had some there. Uh, the, 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 some of them moved into the plantations on the pasture lands of Samaria. And these now intermarried. They began to intermarry with, with those who were brought in. So the Samaritans, remember you know, that, that these were Jews who were left there. And they began to intermarry with other people who were brought in from other races. 
And so they, they were no longer a pure Jewish race. The Samaritans, who were Jews, were no longer a pure Jewish race. They were intermarried with others. So 70 years later, remember that, that Jeremiah had talked about them being in captivity for 70 years. So 70 years later, when the captivity was over and they came back, the Samaritans came to help them to rebuild the Jerusalem, the temple and all that stuff. You read about it in Daniel 9, that the temple would be, the walls will be rebuilt and the temple and so on. So when, when they came back here, when, when Artaxerxes gave the decree to go on to rebuild Jerusalem, and they came back and we read about in Nehemiah, what took, transpired there. When that happened, and the Samaritans now who considered themselves Jews, even though they were remarried, they, they were intermarried with others, the Jews run them away. They call them half-breeds and send them home. We don't want any half-breeds to help us build the temple. We don't want any half-breeds to build Jerusalem. So the Samaritans went and built their own temple and the Jews considered that temple a pagan temple. So the feud, the, the conflict grew and by the time that Jesus came to earth, the Jews hated the Samaritans so much that they would not pass through their land. They preferred to cross the Jordan River to get to where they were going than to pass through the Samaritan lands. So that is how the conflict was. But at this point in time, Jesus decided that he was going to go through Samaria. So unlike what the Jews were doing, Jesus was breaking the tradition here. And he was going through, we read, we read up higher in verse, verse 5, that he was going through, passing through Samaria here now. And so in that context, this woman, knowing of the conflict between the Jews and the Samaritans, said, how is it that you, a Jew, Come asking me for water. You know that we have no deal, you know the Jews have no deal with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that said to you, Give me to drink, you would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Jesus is saying, If you knew, the gift of God. Notice, you know, if you knew the gift of God. And the second part is, if you knew who said to you, give me to drink, you would have quick, quick ask him for him to give you living water. The woman said unto him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. So where are you going to get that living water from? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself and his children and his cattle? <laughs> so the woman was in the physical realm. She was in the material realm. She was looking at the well that she could see that Jesus sat on. She was looking at the well that Jacob had dug from which they could get water. And that well was a well that always had water. It never ran dry. So when Jesus said, I'll give you living water, she was thinking of this. So she's still saying, you don't have anything to, to dip up water. So how are you going to give me water? But Jesus, as we can recognize, was not looking at this. Jesus was looking into the spiritual realm. Jesus was looking at the living water that he mentioned here, but she never, she missed it. She didn't understand. And today, so few people understand this living water. So few people understand the gift of God. He said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is asking you for water. You know, sometimes God comes to us Jesus comes to us and asks us for something. And because we are looking too materially, we're looking too much at the physical, we fail to recognize the gift of God that he's bringing to us in that moment. And we fail to recognize who it is that is asking us in that moment. And so I believe that many times in our lives, the opportunity to receive that gift of God has passed many of us by. 
I might have told you this already, but I will never forget. Many years ago, way back in the 1980s, I was sitting in a car, in a, in a, in a kind of a yard, a business place. And there was somebody beside me in the car and we were talking. And there was a wide open gate and the lady stepped through the gate and came straight to the car. She had a baby in her hand. And she said to me that she's just coming from the clinic. You know the stories that they always give you. She's just coming from the clinic and she asked me for some money to buy something or whatever. I don't remember exactly what she said. No, it's been a lot of years, 1980s. And I knew I had a hundred dollars in my back pocket. But because this story that she gave me is a story you hear so many times from people who are begging. I looked into her face and I said, I think I said, I don't have any money now. And she looked at me. She didn't respond. She looked right into my eyes. And then she turned away and she walked through the gate. And at that moment, something pricked my heart. And I took out the $100 and I gave it to the guy and I said, Tony, take this and give it to that lady. And he stepped out of the car and he ran to the gate. And he looked down the road in the direction where she had gone. And then I saw him look up the road. Then he looked down again. Then he turned around and looked at me and he spread out his hands. I don't see, he, he didn't say this, but the hands was, in the air. no. <clears throat> From the gate where she stepped through, there was a long wall with a fence going a good distance down the road. She couldn't turn anywhere. She wasn't there. She had disappeared. And it has haunted me. Because I believe if in that moment I had even thought that it could be that God is asking me for something, that God is asking me to do something, I wouldn't have hesitated. I would have taken it out and handed it over right away. This woman didn't know that the Look son of God. God to give up, give you. Say that again? <laughs> exactly. exactly. Beg more to give you. Whatever it is, I would have made sure but you see, we don't see other humans in the way God sees them. And so she saw a Jew. But he I saw... I have a similar experience, but I'll tell you after you finish. Something All right. similar. All right, so you can give us that then. I'll leave a little space at the end so we can share. Because I'm sure we all can find some of these experiences. I'm sure we can, and that's why I'm saying what I'm saying. Because sometimes we don't recognize the gift of God. God is offering you a gift at a particular moment. So when somebody comes to you sometimes and asks you for something, God is offering you the gift, the gift of everlasting life, the gift of love that sharing with somebody, sometimes that's it. And then if you recognize him who is asking you, you would have asked him, give me the water, the living water. And sometimes we fail to ask for the right thing because we fail to recognize the person we are facing. And brothers and sisters, I'm saying to us, that, oh, God is so patient. God was so patient with this woman. Let's go on with her. And Jesus said unto her, Whosoever drinks of this water shall thirst again. Yes. So he's talking about her water, the one in the well. If you drink of this water, you shall thirst again. But whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. 
And so she says unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come here to draw. What was she thinking? She was thinking of a water that she can drink. That means she don't have to thirsty again. She always have water. She don't have to come back to this well to drink. Still in the physical, material realm. So Jesus has to lift her thinking a little higher. And he's continuing. You see how, you see how patient he is with her. And sometimes God has to take his time and be patient with us because it's so we're blind sometimes. It's so we are only seeing the physical. It's so we are only seeing the material. Let's not condemn this woman because we ourselves are guilty of it many times. As in the case I just described to you. But he continues with her now and he said, go call your husband and come here. So I'm gone a little closer to home now. It's not just about this water. It's not just about this place. He's gone into her life, her domestic life. He said, go call your husband and come here. The woman said, I have no husband. Jesus said, you, you have said, well, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and he who you now have is not your husband. So in that, you talk the truth. Thou saidst truly that you don't have a husband. So she has had five husbands and now she has somebody else won't. Or she has somebody living with who is not her husband. And so now he has hit home. Now he has reached her to somewhere where she can identify with. Because he just told her about her life that she never told him. And so she says in verse 19, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. I see that you know something. You know the deeper secrets. Then she says, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Now she's accusing Jesus of saying that, but she's still identifying him with the Jews. Now remember I told you before that Samaritans built a temple up here because the Jews calling them half-breed and weren't, weren't mixing with them so built, they built their own temple. So the Samaritans, so she's saying we, our people, worship in this mountain, the temple that we have up here. But you Jews say that the Jerusalem is a place to worship. So in other words, since you're a prophet, now I want to hear what you have to say about this. Where is a better place to worship? You know, we sometimes we, we tie up ourselves and we occupy ourselves with which denomination is the right denomination. Where should I go to church? Should I be a Seventh-day Adventist? Should I be a Baptist? Should I be a Presbyterian, a Catholic? Where should I go? That's what was occupying her mind. So she finds somebody who knows something and she wants his opinion about the best place to worship. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship you know not what. You don't know what you are worshipping. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. Jesus is playing the card. Jesus is playing the game with her. And he's saying you don't know what you worship. You're, you're talking about a place to worship. Well, you don't know what you're worshipping. If, you, if you're thinking of a physical place to worship, you don't know what you're worshipping. And so those who are taken up with the denomination and this is a true church and my church is the right church and so on. You don't know what you're worshipping because you're following a denomination. You're following a physical worship system. And that's what he's going to, to, to know. <clears throat> but he goes on and says, The hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. And then we go to the verse where we started. God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So what is it to worship in spirit? To worship in spirit 
is to take it outside the realms of the physical and take it inside of the person. When you know who you're worshiping, you worship God within here. Know ye not that your body is a temple of the living God? God dwells there. So the, the place to worship him is not in Jerusalem nor in Samaria. It's not in the Adventist church nor the Baptist nor the Methodist or the Catholic. The place to worship God is in his temple in here so wherever you are whether you're up on the hill or you're in Kingston or you're in Morant Bay or you're in America or wherever you are God dwells with you there you are worshiping him in spirit and in truth truth Jesus says I am the way the truth and the life no man cometh unto the Father but by me you cannot worship God if you're not going through Jesus and so the many the many obstacles to, to getting to God rest right inside of this same idea of the denomination of the Samaria, the church in Samaria or the church in Jerusalem or my church has the truth and your church doesn't have the truth or whatever it is people who are so focused on defending their denominations and their place of worship and their own set of doctrines Jesus was saying if you want to worship the Father you're going to worship him in truth the truth is that it is Jesus who saves not your denomination not your place of worship when Jesus dwells in you wherever you are that's the place to worship God. When Moses went upon the mountainside and he came to the burning bush, God said, this is a place to worship. The ground you're standing on is holy ground. Take off your shoes. Brethren, if, if God does not dwell within, if you are just going to church, as a place of you know when people used to tell you about about God is a church waiting for you you know about about God is there 915 and so you must be there the angels are there God is within you and so they that worship him must worship him within in spirit and you worship him in truth and the truth is in Christ the truth that Jesus Christ is the only way to him and so this verse that we focus on, that we just made our point of interest, it is so important for us to understand it. And there's more that could be pulled out. But brothers and sisters, may your spirits worship God. May you worship God in spirit. May you always hold fast to the truth in Jesus that he will dwell with you wherever you are. God bless us to this end.